My name is Atif Pakai. I'm a vascular surgeon. Uh, I'm the Division Chief of Vascular Surgery here at Amina Health. My name is Teja Shah. I'm a vascular surgeon here at Amina Health. So aneurysms can happen anywhere. So it's not just abdominal aortic aneurysm we talk about. By definition, an aneurysm is defined as something that's over 50% of normal size of the artery. So any artery in the body, when it grows over 50% of what its normal size is, it's called an aneurysm. The general risk factors for AAAs are uh, being a man, having a strong family history of it, uh, COPD, and smoking history. So here was a 64-year-old man who came to the hospital because of uh, protracted leg swelling. In the course, he also had worsening kidney function. This prompted the primary care doctor to order an ultrasound, specifically evaluating the kidneys, a renal ultrasound. And it was in that renal ultrasound that they incidentally identified a very large aneurysm that was estimated to be about 14 centimeters. At that time, uh, vascular surgery was called to evaluate the patient for this large aneurysm. The patient had told me that about 25 years before, his mom had undergone a similar operation uh, for an aneurysm. This patient's aneurysm was 14 centimeters, which is the largest aneurysm with an associated aortocable fistula, or connection between the aorta and the IVC, uh, published in the literature. So uh, clearly this is something that's not typical. Aortocable fistulas are very rare events, even amongst aneurysms, presents in about uh, five to 10% of the population. And amongst those patients, about 0.6% of those percent with aortal cable fistulas. The interesting thing about this case is that um, the patient presented with symptoms that we wouldn't typically associate with a abdominal aortic aneurysm. Um, we don't typically associate leg swelling and the primary care doctor noticed that this leg swelling was out of proportion of what would be considered within the normal range of leg swelling which prompted further workup and allowed us to find this aortic aneurysm, which had grown very large. If a patient presents with symptoms, I think that they're in a grave situation. Um, we take each of those patients as true emergencies that we fix um, as, as immediately as possible. Um, symptoms of, a, of, an, of an aneurysm um, include abdominal pain, back pain, groin pain, and some more of these uh, esoteric symptoms like leg like swelling and potential kidney dysfunction. Um, and this is a telltale sign that the aneurysm has grown to the point where it's ready to rupture. There's a true weakening in one spot um, that's gonna cause symptoms to the patient. So my biggest concerns in this case focused on the fact that the patient was rapidly declining right before our eyes. And while this patient presented to the hospital with just leg swelling initially, over the next day or two, we noticed that his kidneys progressively started failing. He started becoming more short of breath. Uh, there was a tremendous decline that we could see. And it kind of played along to the pathophysiology of what's going on in the body when you have an abnormal connection between a major artery and a major vein. And when you have an abnormal connection between the two, the body goes into a state of shock. And the patient was rapidly declining and kind of led to the sequence of events of going to the operating room as soon as possible and taking the patient. The patient actually required a, a session of dialysis to get some of the fluid off prior to even being able to go to the operating room. And when we started the case, the patient was very sick. In fact, this case presents such unique challenges from an operative standpoint 
the patient rapidly declining and becoming sick was a level that made this case like any other. The patient had a potassium level that was rising. And as we know, high potassium levels are associated with cardiac arrhythmias and eventually arrest. And the patient had a very high potassium level to even start off, which is a bad prognosis. Um, patient pressure rapidly declined the moment the patient underwent anesthesia. And so when we started operating, both Dr. Shaw and myself, we knew we had to work extremely fast um, to get down and work on getting this controlled. And not to mention that when you have a connection between an artery and a vein, the amount of bleeding and the, the, the how fast a vein bleeds is exponential compared to an artery. When the aorta connects to the IVC, the bleeding is largely from the IVC. And even though we had control of the aorta, the IVC is really the key step in this procedure. I had controlled the IVC with my hands to compress it, while Dr. Bakai placed the stitches to close the connection. The vena cava is a vein that usually requires either a manual compression um, of the actual venous structure, and that's essentially what it took, is to control it with our hands by compressing on the actual vein with our hands while the other person tried to close the, the hole with, the, with sutures. This was literally having the patient's life in our hands, the literal sense of that. So I'd since seen the patient in the office uh, a couple times and he uh, had lost an incredible amount of weight. He had gained a great amount of energy, was able to get back to doing all of his activities, back to work. And I really want to point out that this wasn't just uh, Dr. Bakai and myself in isolation. It was really the team, the nursing staff, the anesthesiologists, his primary care doctor, um, and all of the specialists and ancillary staff that are involved in truly taking care of this patient and making this patient whole again. We are a high volume open aortic center. Because of that, I think between our expertise of handling the routine open aortic cases, handling a case of this, uh, of this nature and this complexity really um, felt like routine once the critical portion was over. Mm -hmm. It was just another routine aorta for us. One of the biggest challenges that our community faces is that we don't do as much open surgery as we used to. There's actually now fellowships that have been created to allow for fellows and other vascular surgeons to gain more breadth of experience in open aortic surgery because it's just not done as much. And then even at the, the highest volume centers, they're not doing as much open surgery as they're doing complex advanced endovascular surgery. A case like this kind of highlights the importance of having physicians that are comfortable with open surgery because you really have to work fast, work diligently, and be comfortable. And this can't be somebody's first time doing a case to repair an abdominal aortic aneurysm and to tackle this, this particular problem. You know, one of the things that we're finding now is that patients at a young age, when they present with aneurysms, the traditional endographs that we have seen over the years as being the golden standard approach is, is not, and that we're seeing a lot more failures than we had in the past. We're fortunate to have um, support with our team of fellow physicians that can recognize this. And so they, they see these potential opportunities. And so we then evaluate the patients for the possibility of having open aneurysm repair. So the interesting thing about this is that this is the largest abdominal aortic aneurysm with an associated aortic cable fistula that's been ever reported to be repaired in the world. And what we kind of find is 
fascinating is that we've been able to repair this, fix this right here in our community hospital here in Elk Grove at Amida Health. <laughs>